All right. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Um, I'm coming from Seattle, Washington. So I did move from Duluth. That's where I got my degree from the University of Minnesota in Duluth, but I got a teaching position uh, out in Seattle. So um, it's nice to be here and, and talk to you about my master's work that I just completed. And yeah, talk about hawk owls and what they're doing in the winter in terms of habitat use and movement. Um, so why don't we get started? All right, make sure I can advance that. All right, so just before I kind of dig into the research, sometimes I run out of time, so I wanted to put my acknowledgments first. Um, a lot of people helped with formulating this project and con contributing both in the field and conceptualizing the project. So this is the Northern Huckel project team. My advisor, Dr. Matt Ederson, my lab members at UMD, plenty of folks at Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory, and in particular, Frank Nicoletti, um, and then a lot of uh, people that helped me in the field, my friend and colleague, Abby Valine, Jim and Patsy Duncan, Dr. Alex Alexis Grindy, and Daniel Erickson, um, and many other people that are on the screen. So just, just kind of putting that out there that a lot of people were involved in um, this project. And then funding and other support, and some of you might recognize uh, some of these names. This project was uh, fully funded by grants and donations, so I could not have done it without the support of many organizations. Um, so I just wanted to put that up as well, that both money and people-wise, this was not just me, this was a whole, um, whole slew of folks. So thank you to all of those that are on the screen. All right, so a lot of people, uh, maybe not you all, but ask me if hawk owls are really a hawk or an owl. So they are a true owl species. They're in the Strigidae family, um, right down here. They do have some behaviors um, that are more similar to hawks, as some of you might know. Um, they usually use their eyesight for hunting and they don't have silent flight, but in terms of their phylogeny, they are a true owl. There are three recognized subspecies. Um, so there's one in the US, so that's denoted in purple. There's one in Europe in green, and then one in sort of Northern uh, Central Asia in red. I'm gonna be focusing on the North American subspecies. So this is an eBird, oh, sorry, this is an eBird distribution, sort of just showing all of the reports for their whole Arctic range, which means that it's the same species, but there are three different sort of subspecies where their plumages are slightly different, their sizes are slightly different, but I'm gonna be focusing on the North American subspecies. So this is um, their year round range that kind of mirrors the boreal forest. Um, so you can see that in purple. And then you can kind of see this really light dotted line, which represents sort of the Southern limits of their winter range um, because hawk owls are known to be eruptive. So they can go farther and farther south in search of food, um, depending on which year, which hopefully there's an eruption coming uh, in the next few years. There was one supposed to happen while I was doing my research, but it did not. Um, but just to give you an overall picture, that is the bird that we are focusing on, and that is the range. Um, in terms of hawk owls and why I picked this species, one of the reasons is that they are a climate endangered species. So they're really hard to monitor. And so they're not listed as like a endangered species or species of um, concern. But that's just because we don't really have a good systematic way of getting to know or um, monitoring their population size. But Audubon uh, did some really cool climate maps showing sort of the current climate um, over here in yellow on my left side, where um, hawk owl range is right now. And then adding in a three degree increase in temperature. So jumping from year 2050 over to year uh, 2080 and um, looking at how much range they are losing. So you can see that in red, that is predicted to be the range that they lose with a three degree increase in temperature. And they do gain some of that back in blue. So they're still losing about 20% of their total range. And as you go farther and farther north, um, you know that might not be pretty suitable habitat. They're, they need big trees to nest in. Um, so it's kind of a, a species that is on the brink of, of losing a lot of this boreal forest, um, but you know, they're hard to monitor with breeding bird surveys or Christmas bird counts or standardized surveys anyway. So that's sort of why they are not listed necessarily as a endangered species or species of concern. 
groups. So just a little bit more about them. Um, they are one of the least studied birds in North America. So there's less than 10 empirical research studies that have been done in the US. They are both eruptive and nomadic. So I showed that map showing that they come farther and farther south um, during eruption years. And usually that happens when there's a boom in their population over the summer. And then the following year, there's lots of second year hawk owls roaming around and there's a prey crash. So they come farther and farther south. They're also known to be nomadic. So again, moving around sort of in search of food and not following a typical migratory pathway or a typical residential um, kind of annual life cycle. And then kind of what I focused my research on was their winter ecology because it was largely unknown. So I was kind of searching the literature, looking at birds of the world, looking at eBird and found that there's really not a lot of research on hawk owls in general but specifically looking at the winter um, movements and habitat use um, was unknown. So that was sort of my focus uh, for my project. So a little bit about past research, as I mentioned, there definitely was some past research that was done and sort of helped me formulate my project. One of those was looking at habitat and forestry management. So uh, Patsy Duncan wrote this review of sort of looking at best practices that would benefit hawk owls um, in terms of the habitat that they are in. They found that hawk owls really prefer small cuts or small harvested areas, less than 100 hectares um, for uh, you know, where they live, where they survive, so both nesting and in the winter, and that they need really large snags to be left in those cuts for perches and nest sites. Um, so in terms of just looking at habitat and forestry management, she found that you know smaller cuts with large snags for hunting and nesting is really important for hawk owls. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And then I did want to just touch on that there are prey cycle um, connections uh, with hawk owls, and they do relate really um, closely. So there's a big correlation between um, sort of small male populations and cycles and a lot of different owls, but specifically hawk owl cycles. Um, there are differences in the prey cycles between North America and Europe, and uh, there's been some past research showing that snowshoe hair cycles do impact sort of what prey items uh, hawk owls tend to take. But I just want to preface this in saying I did not do any small mammal work in my uh, master's work. It was just outside the scope of what I could do. But just to put this in your mind that that um, prey cycles are really important for hawk owls and why we find them in certain places. And then to get sort of at more of my question of wanting to look at winter ecology, what these birds are doing, how far they're moving, um, there was a paper by Bacon and Naibo in 1987, and this was in um, Southeast Norway. So we're looking at that um, European subspecies, but it was the first tracking study that had ever been done on hawk owls. And what they found was that they were able to catch five hawk owls, three males and two females, and they were radio tracked. So using handheld telemetry um, for between like three and 16 weeks. And this is kind of their results of trying to discern what these birds were doing and if they were sort of forming a range and then they were really specifically looking at the summer and then into the fall. So you can see that they definitely got some kind of cool data and were able to formulate these ranges. Um, so this was kind of a, a stepping point for me in terms of what I wanted to look at uh, for hawk owls. And then another uh, kind of anecdote that was written by Dr. Robert Nero in 1995 was on a hawk owl that was likely the same bird that he observed for three months, so all winter long. And it really was the first beginnings of thinking about hawk owls staying in one place for a lot longer than we've previously thought in the winter. Because you would think in terms of winter conditions and hawk owls being nomadic, that they would be moving around, you know, at least, you know, somewhat um, from place to place. But he found, and this is his drawing, that um, a hawk owl was really tying to this one area for about three months and kind of mapped out its primary perch sites. Uh, so noted by A and then uh, B over here. And then sort of tracked some of its movements. So really starting to first de define the beginnings of the home range, but um, you know he wasn't able to put a tracker on this bird. It could have been a different bird um, potentially, but it was likely the same one. 
All right, so that is just a little bit of background to give you an idea of where my research questions came from and why I am studying hawk owls. And the questions that I came up with were, one, do hawk owls establish a winter territory or home range? So can we quantitatively figure that out? And then two, looking at some of habitat uh, uh, suitability and looking at um, distribution of hawk owls, since they are so hard to survey, is looking at a distribution model um, and seeing if it can accurately predict habitat suitability for hawk owls using eBird data. So I'll get into those details in a little bit. In terms of my methods, um, there's a big process in trapping and permitting. So I was able to get uh, all of my permitting figured out between Minnesota and Manitoba. And then these are just some traps that we use to catch hawk owls. A lot of people ask me, how do you actually catch these birds? So we use these two traps, the ball chattery trap where the hawk owl is coming in and you'll see a video of this in a minute, but it lands on this trap. There's really soft leg noose harnesses where it's kind of prouncing around. There's a um, lure in the middle and it gets caught that way um, or a dip net. So you have a lure out on a string and you're literally using a dip net to catch the owl because they are so prey driven. Um, so that's just kind of two ways of, of um, catching the owl. Um, in terms of the telemetry timeline, um, so this really impacted my research questions because it is it this project is pretty cutting edge because we have not had a small enough tracking unit to give us the high amount of resolution that you need to understand kind of these habitat nuances and daily movements. And previously, transmitters really were too big for remote tracking of hawk owls. And as a lot of you probably know in the winter using handheld telemetry would be really difficult, especially if a hawk owl is not near any roads. So we needed a unit that could, um, you know, be able to remote track these hawk owls and give us the data online so we didn't have to go and follow the bird around, but we also needed it to be light enough to be in the requirements for putting a tracker on a bird. So this is just a graph showing you that in terms of the number of species and the body mass in grams, that we've come a really long way in, in our ability to track birds um, using certain units. So that's really all that I wanted you to, to get out of that timeline. Um, so going on uh, into more methods, again, it was really hard to figure out if we could get a transmit transmitter that would work for the project and uh, research questions that I had. So I worked with Cellular Tracking Technologies, which is an awesome company that custom made these solar powered GPS GSM cellular unit units that use the cell tower network to um, transmit the data. So there's a lot of concern, there's a lot of hemming and hawing about how this was really going to happen because hawk owls for a lot of their life cycle are in remote areas and there might not be cell service, um, just like with your cell phones, you know, if they go out of service, we won't get the data, it won't download. The data is still taken on the individual unit, but it has to reach cell service to actually download. So that was a big concern. Um, and we thought about using satellite transmitters too and actually purchased a few, but um, there's a long antenna on a satellite unit. And I had talked to a lot of people uh, through Project Snowstorm and they found that snowy owls chew off those antennas pretty regularly. And hawk owls are really feisty, which you will see in a couple of videos um, in a few slides. And so that was sort of a big, kind of risk that we didn't want to take either is, you know, we might not get any data if that um, satellite unit is chewed off. So that was sort of the decision behind this. We were able to fit them on Hawk Owls for the first time, and then we were starting to see some data get transmitted. So it was really exciting to see this process start to work. In terms of my study design, sort of just the steps that I went through to, to get here is one was funding, which you saw there was a lot of funding sources, a lot of small grants that I applied to, uh, friends of Zach Zimbog and other uh, donations were given, which was great. So two, I actually had to find the Hawk, hawk Owls. And since you all are an Audubon chapter, you know that finding Hawk Owls is hard. We do have Zach Zimbog, which is great, um, but it is a tricky kind of um, bird to find and have a big enough sample size for, for a project. 
Um, three, having to get permits and capture the hawk owl and really trying to focus on the southern edge of that winter range um, because that's what we're most interested in with, with climate and them being climate threatened species. And then attach the transmitters, try to track the movements, analyze the movement data to answer questions one, and then build the species distribution model to answer question two. So that's sort of the framework for um, how my project uh, was designed. In terms of locations, just so you can see where all of these birds were caught, um, down here represents our Zach Zimbog bird, um, but most of them were caught uh, in Roseau, Minnesota, or near there, and then up into southern Manitoba. So for a total of four in Minnesota and seven in Manitoba. And then they were really dependent on hawk owl locations. So we would you know, have a network of people reporting sightings to us, um, and being able to drive all of that way. So down here is probably familiar to you all since you're in Minneapolis, but Duluth is at the tip of uh, Lake Superior. So trying to figure out the logistics uh, for how to get to these birds um, was a big part of, of, you know, going through this process to get this range of that southern edge of their boreal forest uh, habitat. And then uh, this work also wouldn't have been possible without collaborating with Jim and Patsy Duncan, who are two awesome researchers in Canada and really uh, made it possible since there was not an eruption of hawk owls, where we usually have more that come down into northern Minnesota to expand all the way up into southern Manitoba. All right, so just a little bit more for methods of kind of watching this process happen. Um, so the hawk owl that will be coming in is right up here. Hopefully you can see my mouse um, and I will just go ahead and play this video. Whoops. Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, this is the same screen. I, I accidentally put a picture inside of the video, but basically what you would be seeing is this hawk owl coming into a trap. And I think the video is a little later on. But I, what I wanted to kind of just show you, because I've been talking quite a bit at this introduction, is just some pictures of where I've seen these hawk owls and in what habitats they've been in. And then also just the call of hawk owl, if you have not heard that before. If you can hear that. They like to sit up at the top of the canopy. And that's probably where a lot of you have seen them, if you have seen them. Get harassed by a lot of different species. Sometimes see farmland. <laughs> and they can be difficult to access, even if you spot them off of a road. All right, so that was just kind of a few scenes and now you'll actually see the video of the hawk owl um, coming into the trap. So I'll play it one more time just because it's kind of cool to watch it fly in. They are very prey driven species. And so if you find one, most of the time you're going to catch it, uh, be able to process it. Um, it takes about 45 minutes to, to process um, the hako by putting the transmitter on, taking measurements, weighing it, things like that, um, and then releasing it. And we didn't have any issues um, with birds being stressed. We made sure the temperature was really um, you know, similar to outside, which was really cold and, and hard to move your fingers in. Um, but yeah, that is sort of the, the catching and trapping process. Um, speaking of the conditions, they were pretty extreme. So the coldest temperature, I think it was in 2022, that I encountered was negative 42 degrees. Um, again, I've given this presentation to people who live in New Mexico or warmer places, and they're pretty shocked by that. But all of you in Minneapolis, I'm sure, kind of know the deal that you have experienced these cold temperatures too. Um, and then, yeah, just working and driving in these locations. We did lots of snowshoeing, um, lots of, you know, looking at spruce tops, as you can see from this picture, that fool you and make you think there's a hawk out there when there really isn't. Um, so just to give you an idea of what those conditions look like. 
And then just a couple of videos of a haka that we uh, put a transmitter on. This was a bird near Roseau, Minnesota. All right, so this is a northern hawk owl, and it's getting a little backpack transmitter. Um, so what we've done is we've put the harness uh, over the front and sort of fitted it to the spot on its back um, where it's loose enough that, you know, it still has some flexibility, but will stay in place. Um, and so now we tied some knots, and I'm going to go out and let the bird flap um, to make sure that there's no uh, impairment to the wing. Okay, so we'll watch the bird. All right. All right, so now we're going to just uh, make sure it can flap and see if it's kind of symmetrical on both sides. It's definitely ready uh, to get going, but it looks like it's flapping fine. Uh, so now we'll just go ahead and finish up sewing the transmitter, gluing it, and get this bird on its way. And they are really feisty, as you probably saw in the video. Um, they were pretty calm when you were putting the actual transmitter on. But when they first, you know, got that sense of being able to flap and fly away, um, you know, most of them were ready to go. This is like the best moment that any field researcher has. This bird's flying away, looking fine, um, and going back to their normal behavior. All right, so just a little snippet into what that process looked like. Um, so that brings us to results. And this is just a field data summary um, from when I was able to uh, do for my master's work. I always, you know, it, it would be awesome to keep doing this. Um, so, you know, if someone else wants to take charge or maybe a PhD in the future, um, it would be great to keep monitoring these birds. But this was just in the winter of, uh, to 2021 to 2023. And we were able to catch and ban 20 birds. We deployed 11 transmitters. So there's a weight threshold. So not all birds uh, met the weight threshold. We got an average about 12 points a day. Um, and the average days tracked was about 56. Um, so almost to that two month mark. Some it was much longer, but some it was much shorter. Um, we caught five or six males and 14 females. Only two males got the transmitter because they are generally smaller. Um, and uh, nine females uh, also had transmitters. And then we drove about 17,000 kilometers, took about 18 hours, and there were 13 field volunteers that uh, helped me in this work. So it was a pretty concerted effort, um, you know, trying to get as many owls as possible and, and making, you know, the non-eruption year uh, work for this project. And you can see one of my favorite pictures of a very feisty hawk owl um, taking a nibble. All right, in terms of how I analyzed the data, um, so I looked at home ranges, so trying to figure out if hawk owls were really sticking to a particular area um, during the winter or if they were moving around and being no more nomadic, how we've previously thought. And I used the minimum convex polygons method and kernel density estimates. And both of these are just uh, methods used in kind of um, analysis or statistical framework to either one for minimum convex polygon, look at the perimeter of points. So not looking at density, but just the perimeter of the size of the uh, polygon or using kernel density estimate, which takes into account the density of points in places and formulates the range around that. And then you don't need to necessarily get into the details unless you want to here, but there is a, a quite a bit of autocorrelation that occurs with tracking data. So I had to kind of add in some code to account for that to make sure there weren't points being uh, taken into account that were uh, overlapping other points. Um, so that was a little bit about those methods. And then for the species distribution model, I use maximum entropy modeling, which is really good for presence only data. So I didn't have absence because I was using eBird data. I just had presence only data. So I couldn't say, okay, there's a hawk owl for sure here, but not one in you know this bog or habitat. Um, so that's what I mean by presence only. And then it's really uh, does well with small sample sizes and it's a machine learning method. So basically it goes through an iterative process where it's going through this um, modeling and building this uh, suitability map. And I chose uh, 10,000 iterations. You can change the size, um, but I wanted to, to really get an idea of what that looked like. So it's kind of learning from those iterations. 
And here's just a visual. Again, this is a lot of detail, so don't get too hung up on it and feel free to ask me after. But basically you're using environmental data um, and occurrence data. You're putting that into a modeling algorithm. Mine is Maxent down here, but there are other ones. And then you are um, calibrating the model and then getting a predicted distribution that leads to habitat suitability. So that's sort of just the, the flow of how that works. Um, so in terms of what my results were, uh, do hawk owls establish a winter territory and home range? The answer is yes, at least from this sample size. We were pretty shocked to see that each hawk owl, um, you know, there's a lot of variation, but each hawk owl did stick to a territory pretty much all winter if we got that data for the whole winter. Um, there are some really small uh, home ranges that were only about two kilometers squared in size. Um, and there was a couple of those which was pretty shocking to think about a hawk owl, um, you know, spending most of its winter time in, you know, the size of like, I don't know, a football field or something like that. Um, not a large swath of land or I should say half a football field. Um, and then there were other hawk owls that definitely had larger ranges. You can see this one up here. Um, and I wanted to show you this whole graphic just because there was quite a bit of variation. Um, the outline in black shows you the uh, MCP, so looking at the perimeter, and then in blue you have 50%, 75%, and 95% of that density um, home range. So yeah, that was sort of a, a conclusive answer to question one, that it does seem like they stick around one area for the winter and maybe are not quite as nomadic if they find a good spot as we have previously thought. Um, this is comparing just the minimum and the maximum size. So again, around two kilometers uh, squared for one bird was the minimum, and then the maximum was 34 kilometers squared. So much different, and there's a lot of individual variation um, in these home range sizes. Um, to give you an idea of what this looks like with some satellite imagery behind it, so this was a female that had the largest home range, and these were all individual locations um, that she had. And we got data from her uh, for, I think, two months of the winter. And she was really bouncing around a lot of different habitat types. So all the habitat types that I included, and there was 11 of those, um, were included in her core range. So even kind of narrowing down the range, she was bouncing around farmland and coniferous forest and wetlands and um uh, kind of develop land and things like that. So cool to see that just over a satellite image of all the places that she visited. And then this was in Roseau, Minnesota, where we caught two birds really close to each other. Um, later on when I did uh, sexing, I found out that one was a male and one was a female. Who's to say, I don't know if they, you know, were a pair or anything like that. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't able to see, you know, uh, their breeding or anything. Um, but it was really cool because um, one had a really small range. So the female, you know, it was pretty small. It wasn't the smallest, but, you know, three kilometers squared was not big. And then the male had a much larger range, you know, four or five times the size of the female. So it was cool to be able to see that they overlapped a little bit, but really they had different ranges and were going to different places uh, in terms of habitat where they were. And here's the birds uh, down here, just so you can get a visual of what they look like. Um, and then in terms of a couple more, just kind of male female comparisons, I did some statistical tests uh, comparing them. There was not a significant difference in size, but we only had two males. So you have to keep that in mind when, when looking at the data, there's only two um, data points for males. So who's to say, but it was cool to see sort of these comparisons, um, at least just to observe what they were doing. So these were two birds up in Canada and sort of had more of the, the average size ranges. Um, and again, just kind of looking at those over the satellite imagery. All right, um, so then that brings me to question number two is looking at a species distribution model and seeing if we can accurately predict um, habitat suitability for hawk owls using eBird data. So I use 616 unique eBird observations from 2000 to 2022. I had to do a huge filtering process for this eBird data um, using R and um, the awk patch package, um, but basically I couldn't use hotspots and I couldn't use observations that had the same 
location. Um, so it was, it was a big process, but I was able to get quite a bit of data. Um, making sure they were independent observations. So not, you know, if you're going birding with a group of people, it wasn't, you know, getting that same hawk owl that 50 different people saw, which does happen in the bog occasionally. Um, and then I use nine land cover variables and then three edge characteristics. So I think I made a mistake. I said 11, but I used 12 um, habitat characteristics to put into my model to see how hawk owls were using the habitat. And then also if they were using these edge characteristics based off of distances to forest, open water, and then open land. So that would be things like grasslands and prairies. Um, and then just to kind of give you another visual of how this works is you're using this tracking data, um, or excuse me, this eBird data um, and tracking data to put into a, kind of an occurrence map. And then you're using environmental layers, putting it into the model. I use maximum entropy and then getting a prediction map. And then the next step is getting the habitat suitability map. So just to kind of refresh your mind of how, how that actually works. And then what I was able to get is these two habitat suitability heat maps. So to orient you to these, I focused on my uh, kind of study site of Northern Minnesota and Southern Manitoba. And um, the blue represents, um, you know, no hawk owls present, terrible hawk owl habitat. And then red represents the best hawk owl habitat that exists in those locations. And then green and yellow can be, you know, habitat where hawk owls uh, potentially are found, but not the most suitable. So as you can see from the one in northern Minnesota, there are lots of little kind of you know, really good hot spots for habitat of hawk owls. Um, so my model is sort of picking up these areas where there are a lot of edges and a lot of um, uh, kind of wetland or boggy areas. So it was cool to see this is Red Lake upper and lower. And a lot of these areas that I've spent some time in have these, you know, really um, bog areas where there's an open area and then uh, there's lots of edges of conifer trees, tamarack, black spruce, things like that, and big snags. So it was cool to see, you know, the the map reflecting, you know, these really hot spots for for habitat suitability of hawk owls in northern Minnesota. And then in terms of uh, uh, southern Manitoba, the story was a little bit different. Um, at first, we thought it would, you know, be pretty much exactly the same because it's similar in terms of, you know, geographic location. But we found that there was a lot more fragmented pieces of, of really suitable hawk owl habitat. They're still pretty red, so you can kind of see the quality is a little bit hard, um, but you can see, still see some red dots mixed in with the yellow. And looking back at sort of the, the agriculture and things like that in both of these places, uh, the land in southern Manitoba is much more fragmented. And so there's a lot of um, agriculture or farm fields mixed in with their, you know, big boggy uh, type areas. I will say up in sort of these kind of blue areas above Lake Winnipeg, which is right here, there's a lot of dense conifer forest that's super, um, you know, big areas of conifer forest. And hawk owls did not like that. So in some other analyses, um, there was actually a negative association with um, just dense conifer forest. So they really needed that sort of sweet spot of having some open areas within um, some forests with edge. So it was kind of cool to see those differences in both northern Minnesota and southern Manitoba. Um, and then uh, again, not you don't have to get into the nitty gritty here unless you want to, but we're looking at this um, curve where we're looking at how good the model was. So if the model was not good um, and it was random, it would follow this straight line on this graph. And that represents about 0.5. So it'd be like 50, 50% of these you know, uh, uh, predictions could either go, you know, this is good for hot cows or this is not good for hot cows. It would just be completely random. So we did find that our, our models were pretty good. So for Minnesota, it explained 73% of the, of the hot cow habitat. And then in Manitoba, it explained uh, 83%. So the big takeaway is that the models did pretty well at predicting habitat suitability for hot cows. Um, there's definitely some refinement. Um, and then again, we're using eBird data um, so there's some, um, you know, biases with that of people actually seeing the birds versus seeing where the birds, you know, actually are um, in those areas. So 
again, um, not a perfect representation, but a pretty good model um, for hawk owl habitat. So one uh, we did find in terms of key takeaways that hawk owls do have winter home ranges and some were a lot smaller than we expected. Two, hawk owls select habitat with edges. And I didn't show you, but there are some other plots that show that they really avoided farmland and grasslands in the winter, which was also surprising because um, a lot of reports and a lot of anecdotal evidence that I've had or seen says that they saw hawk owls near farmland. But even if they were next to, you know, say a chunk of farmland, it seemed like they were actually using, you know, maybe the bog or conifer forest next to that farmland for a lot more time. Um, so it was cool to see that they actually didn't use farmland or grasslands a lot in the winter. And then three, I just wanted to say that I think it's really important to collect information on these understudied species. Um, you know, I was just at the World Owl Conference uh, in Wisconsin a few months ago, and no one else was studying hawk owls. You know, there's lots of other species represented, but uh, it is a, an important species to study, and I think one that kind of goes under the radar in terms of scientific research, just because they are hard to study, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't um, study them. So in terms of future goals, um, it would be great to expand the study to the full southern range across North America and kind of get that whole swath of the boreal forest and also increase sample size, which is just, you know, something that all research researchers should want to do. And then looking at climate modeling, habitat suitability, and small mammal presence and putting those all together to see if we have a more informative map for hawk owl movement and presence uh, in certain habitats. And then expanding to spring and summer movements and looking at dispersal rates. That would be a really interesting question that I got some summer data, but not a lot, but it'd be great to have more. And then also just informing sort of conservation and land management plans for northern forests. You know, if there's a bunch of black spruce, you know, um, harvesting going on, maybe trying to do smaller cuts, leaving snags, which I know a lot of uh, forestry folks are already doing, um, but just trying to inform those a little bit more. And then just some bonus data. Um, so this was total movements from five of the birds in from the 2021 to 2022 season. Um, and then I did include um, the hawk owl that we did catch uh, um, in March of 2023, just because it was the one in Zach's and Bog and I wanted to include it. But it was really cool to see some of these summer movements. And basically all of the blue dots represent where I caught the bird and where their home range was in the winter, and then where they kind of ended up in the spring and summer. Unfortunately for the Zach Zimbog bird, it stopped transmitting. There was no mortality signal, um, but maybe the unit failed or something like that. I went up and tried to look for it and couldn't find it. Um, so we don't have any further data on that. Um, it kept checking in until about the end of May, um, but then we lost, lost track of it. But yeah, anyway, I just wanted to show you this because it seems like there's a possibility that hawk owls are more migratory than we previously thought. A couple of these birds went, you know, over a thousand kilometers uh, in their journey. And I wanted to show you just one of those animations. And this was a bird, it was that female that was caught in Roseau, Minnesota. So this is just showing you the winter range and the density of points in that area, which was pretty phenomenal. Um, I think she had over 2000 points um, of data and really focused in this one area. And then in about a week, she made this journey and they all the birds that left for the summer left around the same time, uh, about the third week of March. Um, so it's really interesting and, you know, potential breeding is 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 um, one of the reasons, but I can't confirm that. So spent a lot of time in this really cool area with no roads. And then went farther and farther north. And then um, we lost track of this bird in the summer, but there was a pretty high density of points, um, which was cool to see. All right, um, so I did wanna just give a shout out to the hawk owls themselves. Uh, it was the most important thank you. Um, you know, working with birds, I, I come from a place of not wanting to impact them, um, you know, wanting to have the least amount of effect and, and not 
causing any stress or things like that. But you do have to capture birds to put transmitters on them. Um, so it's awesome to be able to do that and not have any issues um, with these birds and just being able to see them up close too. There's a lot of individual variation that I hadn't known um, about hawk owls. So it was cool to see so many different ones. So big thank you to them. And I think in terms of questions, we have plenty of time. Um, so yeah, I will go ahead and open that up. Sorry if I went a little bit fast. I, I get a little nervous if it's an hour long talk and I wanna include a lot of detail. Yeah, thank you so much. And I know you say they're ferocious, but they're so sweet. I love <laughs> okay, go ahead and put any questions you have in the chat. Um, and we have one question. To start off with, um, did you find any correlation between hawk, the hawk owl winter range size and habitat suitability? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I didn't actually look at what their winter range habitat was in comparison to the habitat suitability that I use for eBird data. That was partly because I wanted to at first look at that because I think it's a really interesting question. But it was hard because I only had one individual bird with all of these different data points, and I wasn't able to get rid of the 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 fact that they it heavily weighed the model because it was coming all from the same individual. So I was not able. I used the points, but I wasn't able to use their actual range. If that makes sense, but that's a really good question, and I would like to delve deeper into kind of seeing. Okay. If this is suitable habitat, is that the habitat that's being picked up in my individual home ranges? And in terms of kind of anecdotally, not in terms of my analysis, I would say yes. Um, most of the birds used tamarack bog specifically. A lot of them were in areas where there was black spruce present, but they weren't using those areas as much. I went and did some vegetation sampling um, at all of the transmitter bird sites, comparing the most heavily used areas to a randomized point. And it was really cool to see that, uh, just a lot of tamarack bog, which I don't necessarily specifically associate them with. Um, so that's kind of just one one anecdote to your, to your awesome question. And do you know why they enjoy the bog environment so much? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot has to do with the natural openings that bogs allow um, because hawk owls, you know, are kind of a sit and wait predator where they're sitting on top of a snag and they're using their eyesight. Um, so they want to be pretty high up in the canopy, but then be able to see either, you know, a field or, um, you know, an open bog, um, maybe not so much a closed bog um, or road. A lot of people see them along roads. So that they can find small mammals and they they can find small mammals just like great grays uh you know through some hearing and seeing them or hearing them under the subnivian zone i've seen hawk owls you know plunge into the snow to get a prey item um but yeah i think in terms of both um big snags next to you know kind of an open area um seems like a really sweet spot for hawk owls and in the boreal forest that's sort of the natural um, kind of structure that hawk owls prefer, but they've actually been found to, um, you know, really inhabit uh, burns. So if there's a burn that happens um, and that causes, you know, some open areas to, to, to be perfect for hunting, there's also a lot of small mammal disturbance and then still having some big trees that make it in the burn representing those snags, um, hawk owls are definitely prone to, to using those areas. Great. We have a few questions from the audience too. Um, yeah. Could you estimate the bird's age and did that impact their range size? Yeah, so we wanted to get sort of a, a age distribution and we were only able to get one adult, which was actually the bird in Zaxxon Bog. Um, so one compared to 10, um, we call them second year birds, but they're a bird that was you know born within a year. And because I only had one adult, it was really hard to say if there was a difference in terms of their range. It didn't look like it, um, but I would want a bigger sample size for the adults. And that's sort of what happens with field research. You have sort of a, a study design idea and you have statistics and power to back it up. And then, um, you know, we just weren't able to to get those uh, differences. 
Good question though. This question, um, within their winter ranges, did the birds tend to use one part more early in the season and then another part later in the season or was it just random use of the habitat within the range? Yeah, um, I would say for a couple birds that did happen where it seemed like they were really using not, you know, I didn't map out primary perch sites or anything like that, but they were kind of using two dense areas. And for at least one of them, um, it was sort of temporal where it was like, okay, they used, you know, this area for a month and then sort of transitioned and used this area. But for most of them, it was pretty random. Um, and I did try to look and see if there were some roosting sites. Um, so if they were going back to the same areas uh, night after night and really what it looked like, and again, it would be awesome to actually observe this, is that hawk owls were hunting and, you know, doing whatever they were doing during the day, trying to survive these harsh conditions, and then would really just roost in an area pretty close to where they had stopped hunting. Um, so there was a few birds that it looked like they were roosting in a similar area, but really it could be kind of random because there wasn't a big concentration of points in just one, you know, spot uh, for a lot of them. But yeah, so I'd say in terms of kind of temporal change within the ranges, it was fairly random for most birds, but then um, for a couple, it wasn't. Um, okay, I might have totally missed this, but how do the trackers come off? Do they eventually just kind of fall off or? Yeah, so they're, they're not made to fall off. So the birds will have them unless they chew them off, which is definitely possible, um, but they're not made to, to break apart after time. And we, we definitely weighed a lot of options there and talked to especially Project Snowstorm, who works on um, snowy owls doing a similar kind of looking at winter movements. And Scott Widensall and Dave Brinker had this um, uh, material called Spectra that worked really well for them of, of the, you know, not getting chewed off to the point where you weren't getting any data. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some research papers out there that say that there isn't any um, downside for the bird keeping that on. Um, it's less than 3% of their total body weight. Um, but yeah, the ones that we used will, will not fall off naturally. All right. If anybody else has any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I guess I have a question about like, so you put out this whole research project, but once you actually have the owl in your hand and you're actually doing the physical physical research, what changed for you? Um, did anything change? Did your approach change or was it pretty consistent? Yeah, I would say at first, you know, it. there's a lot of nerves that come into play. I've handled a lot of raptors. So I worked at Hawk Ridge um, and, you know, thousands of raptors banded, things like that. I worked at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory. So definitely had a lot of uh, bird handling skills. But if it's your own project and, you know, this was really novel of these units and this type of research has never been done on hawk owls, I was, you know, definitely wanting the best situation to happen. I didn't want a bird to, you know, be injured or anything like that. So when we've caught the first one, it was super exciting. Um, I definitely took longer um, than I wanted to. It took, I think, like an hour and 15 minutes or something like that. Um, and so I definitely, you know, put things in different places for the next bird, I kind of thought through the process of trying to get the transmitter, you know, on the bird in a very efficient way and was able to cut that time down um, almost in half um, by, you know, the second or third bird. So I would say I definitely made some changes after catching the first bird. Um, we also had to take a small blood sample. So making sure, you know, that was all set up and ran smoothly. Um, yeah, I would say my biggest things that I changed is just my confidence and my abilities of making sure, you know, the transmitter was on right and I got a better feel for that as I continued with more birds um, and realizing that, you know, this was real empirical research and I was getting good data from it. So, yeah, if that kind of answers your question uh, in a rambling way. <laughs> <laughs> um. This is a question from the audience. Did you have a favorite individual bird in the study? Ooh, um, that's a great question. I I do have a favorite handling of a bird that didn't actually get a transmitter. It was too small, but it was the nicest hawk owl I have ever 
worked with and it never bit me. It never footed me, which is when their talons grab you. Um, I actually, we got permission. Um, it was, it was near a farm, um, to catch it right by the farm. And I wouldn't normally do this, but, uh, the farmer's daughter was there and she was, I think around 12 or something like that. And I let her release it. Um, and it was, you know, the nicest bird. And so it was just like a really cool moment, um, to work with a bird that was not quite as, as feisty. Although I love the feisty ones too, but maybe that's a favorite. And then the bird in Zexim, um, it, it was, awesome. It was a really smart hawk owl and it took a lot of um, ingenuity and attempts to try to catch it. And I think that's because so many people, you know, had seen it and it had seen people. And um, yeah, I think there is definitely some, some anthropogenic effects of, of birds seeing humans a lot versus not at all. Um, so it was, it was definitely an interesting bird and the most unique uh, individual. And it was an adult too, um, that I got to work with. Um, and it was cool to share it with the greater Zaxim community. Um, so I'd say those are kind of two, two favorites. Yeah. Um, what new directions for conservation efforts and policy or like management do you see resulting from your research? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if, if there will be any from just my research in particular, but I think there's a lot of studies going on in the southern boreal forest where we're seeing a lot of trees dying. Um, so a lot of um, our northern forests with the temperature that has already increased right now. So that data was in 2015 that I showed you of their normal range. Now we're in 2023, almost 2024. And over that time frame, there has been, you know, significant warming already. And a lot of these northern trees are starting to recede and needing, you know, potential help from, from researchers with assisted migration of trees and things like that. So I think, I think the biggest influence it could have is trying to conserve as much habitat. So looking at those habitat suitability maps um, as possible. So not cutting you know, big swaths of black spruce, um, but trying to either mitigate the size of those cuts um, or things like that. And I would love to to be in touch with um, folks that are actually doing that work to talk with them. It's hard when it's, you know, it's one bird species that's not, you know, endangered or threatened. A lot of times it takes a lot of effort for um, the recognition to get there. And so I think by doing this work and hopefully in inspiring other people to, to look at hawk owls, in addition to other boreal species, um, we'll start seeing some more change, or that's at least my hope. Um, but that's a really great question. And I feel like a question that's not asked enough of researchers of, of how are you actually um, influencing these decisions? Um, we have a question about like some more specifics about um, the trapping process yeah. of how exactly you trap the, the hawk owls? Yeah. So um, like you saw, we have those kind of two styles of road trapping. That's what um, a lot of people call them of using the ball chetri trap or the dip net. And basically once you find a hawk owl, um, you know, you're, you're setting that trap up, you're putting a lure in and, you know, the hawk owl will hopefully come in after you're watching it the whole time, after it comes in, you know, it gets caught or you have it in your net, um, you run out and grab it. And then um, through USGS, through the bird banding lab in DC, we have little aluminum bands that have a nine digit code that are unique. So the nine digit code, um, you know, identifies the owl to an individual. And then um, I take uh, wing cord measurements, I weigh it, um, I'm putting the transmitter on it, take a small blood sample for sexing, um, and, you know, once that process is done, then releasing the bird right back into the same habitat. And then I watched the bird for about 15 minutes, making sure, you know, nothing weird was happening, that it was flying fine, um, and resume normal behavior. Um, so yeah, I guess that's a little rundown of the trapping process and the banding process and putting the transmitter on. Um, but if there's more specifics, I can, I can answer those too. Yeah. Um. Are those transmitters still sending data that can be accessed? Yeah, unfortunately, I have not gotten any updates. Um, the units that we had had previously been put on Broadwing Hawks by Lori Goodrich, and then they were 
I think also designed and maybe put out uh, on a few short eared owls. Um, but their lifespan is about two years um, if if it reaches that. And we found that either the hawk owl went out of cell service and never checked back in, um, or the you know battery life died in these extreme cold conditions and was ne never able to kind of get that solar charge back up. Um, but I haven't heard from any of the birds, which is really disappointing. And I was hoping that at least you know, one bird would come back the following winter and we could see that full annual cycle. Um, but alas, um, we were not able to, to get that. So still hope, um, especially for the Zaxim bird. Um, but yeah, I will, I will definitely keep people updated if I hear anything. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even think about the cold. That's a really good point. Yeah. Okay. How long on average did it take from capture to release? Yeah, on average, it was about 48 minutes. Um, so, you know, a good chunk of time, but really trying to be efficient in um, getting that transmitter on, but making sure it looks right, um, weighing it, all of those things that I mentioned. Um, we also took some standardized pictures to see if we could tell any uh, morphometric female uh, male differences. Um, so, yeah, I think on average, it was that long. Some took only 30 minutes, some took, you know, a little over an hour, especially those first ones. Um, and again, just with more practice, more repetition, it would be great to to keep doing this and keep making adjustments to, to make it as efficient as possible. Um, yeah, but we didn't have any birds that experienced any heat stress or, um, you know, stress calls. When we would let them flap, a lot of times they kind of made that kind of chitter call, which is sort of an alarm call, but it was, I think, because they realized they were almost free and they thought they could fly away. Um, uh, and then they didn't resume that in hand. So it was really nice to, to see that because in some studies with uh, some species, they're a lot more sensitive um, to handling and capturing and things like that. But hawk owls uh, don't seem uh, that way, except you do want to make sure you're not, you know, putting them in a really hot environment after they've been in a really cold environment. Um, so we made sure that didn't happen. Did you did you let them have their little like lore treat that you brought them in with? No, not usually. That oh. is um, <laughs> not uh, a good practice in the banding <laughs> community. Um, it's tough. I mean, a lot of people. A lot of people do, a lot of people don't, um, you know, I'm, yeah, I, I did not. Um, but if there's any folks out there that do, I wouldn't, you know, shun you or anything like that. Uh, but in general, you know, you're not wanting to uh, uh, add in anything to their diet um, that they wouldn't get in, in nature. But they got a cool transmitter out of the deal, so. They did. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it was cool. There was a couple of birds that I went back and visited. And then folks also sent me some pictures from Manitoba. And of course, the Zach Zimbog one. And it was just great to see the transmitted birds, you know, catching food and um, looking good. And we did actually have one transmitter fail right away. So there was 12 that were put on originally, but one failed within like three days. And it was on an adult, which was unfortunate. Um, it was up in Canada. And after two months, we were able to actually recapture the bird and take the transmitter off. Um, and it looked great. It had gained weight. Um, there was no rubbing or anything caused by the harness material. So it was actually kind of nice to be able to, you know, have one on a couple months later and see how it was doing um, by taking it off. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. I have one last question, unless anybody else wants to put anything in the chat. Um, what is the advantage to the hawk owl of having a smaller home range, or is there an advantage? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think in terms of looking at the remote sensing data, it would be great to actually go and like survey this bird every single day. Um, but I think what that means is these birds have found a really good food source and really good habitat so that they don't have to move, you know, because migrating, flying, that all costs a lot of energy. And so I think I, my understanding is that if they have a smaller range, 
they're and surviving, they are in a really good uh, habitat um, or good. They have they have good habitat, which means they also have a good food source. So another thing that I'm really interested in is looking at the habitat of these small mammals that they prefer. So they really prefer um, red-backed voles, sometimes meadow voles. They will take other prey items in the winter, like squirrels, or there was evidence of one um, catching a, a ermine, so a really lo long white ermine that someone photographed in the bog. So they will they will take other uh, prey items, but that might be um, for birds that are not in a good spot where they don't have a really good kind of honey hole of small mammals um, that they're able to just stick to one area. So that would be my guess because, you know, flying around more, going to different areas might mean they're looking for those really good spots but not finding them. Um, so yeah, that I think that's my kind of understanding, but again, not, not necessarily proven or supported. Um, well, thank you so much for your time, Hannah, and thank you all for coming out. I hope you had a great time learning about the Northern Hawk Owl, um, and this program will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel as well, so everybody can go back and take a look, and please join us in January for our avian architecture across the Islamic world program, so that'll be great. Sounds interesting. Yeah, thank you all for, for coming again, and if you do have further questions, feel free to look at my email. I'm not great at Instagram and haven't updated it in a while, but I do have a project in Instagram if you are interested in looking at that. But thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.